Good afternoon and welcome to a special edition of Liverpool Life Reports. Mark Carney is one of the most important people in the country at the moment as the Governor of the Bank of England. This afternoon he'll be delivering the Roscoe Lecture here at Liverpool and uh, he's joined us now for an exclusive interview. Uh, Governor Carney, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Nathan. Um, a report released just a couple of days ago um, is showing that the UK is one of the greatest regional differences in wealth of any country in Europe. Um, that's from your Chief Economist. What measures do you think the bank can do to help areas like Liverpool? Well, it's actually a very, I recommend the speech, uh, Red Card, Blue Card, uh, by uh, Andy Haldane, who's chief economist, as you say, at the bank. And he does draw out these big regional differences. Uh, here in the Northwest, um, you know, uh, uh, notable, notably below the levels of wealth and income, for example, in the Southeast. Now, then the question is, what can be done about that? From the Bank of England's perspective, uh, we can do a bit. We can provide some of the foundations. We keep inflation under control and make sure the financial system works. But the big aspects, the big things that will make a difference, which will raise the levels of, uh, of well-being, of, uh, of productivity, of wealth here in Liverpool, Merseyside, beyond, um, have to be done by other uh, levels of government, so not the bank. We provide some of the basics, but not the big things that uh, will, will help close the gap. Are you worried that the Brexit vote is going to hinder investment into the north of England? Well, I think we have to look at it as an opportunity. It's a decision of the people of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. Uh, it's important that this process of determining what the new relationship will be with Europe is as smooth and as um, orderly as possible, uh, and that businesses here in the Northwest um, and across the country can plan with as much certainty as possible for not just that new relationship with Europe, but potentially new ones with uh, the United States, with Canada, Australia, China, the big emerging economies of the world. Uh, that's what will bring investment on. Um, this process will create a number of changes, uh, and it's up to all of us to make them as, as, as positive as possible. You've, you've reported in the past that you, uh, following the Brexit vote, you want to see a transitional period. Mm. Could you explain more what that, what that would look well, like? Well, it's, it's an issue. I think it's best explained for heavily regulated sectors such as uh, the financial services sector or, let's say, pharmaceuticals uh, sectors, you know, drug rules and, and, and patents and things. And the important thing is that uh, the Prime Minister and the UK government is going to be involved in very difficult negotiations over the course of the next couple of years with the European partners. Uh, the question is what happens at the end of those negotiations. Some things will change, some will remain the same. Are businesses going to be able to take advantage of those changes, adjust to those changes overnight? Because the way these negotiations work, everything doesn't come together until the last minute, in fact, the last second. There's the expression in trade deals is nothing agree is agreed until everything is agreed. So the idea is that once everything is agreed, business would have a bit of time to restructure, reorient, uh, invest, and move forward. Now, that's an ideal. That's the best for the financial services sector, for pharma, even for autos, other sectors like that. Whether that's possible, given all the other things that the government has to negotiate and set priorities for, remains to be seen. Uh, so it's one element, but we leave it to, uh, we leave it to the government to do determine what's right, what's necessary, what's in the best interest. When you became governor in 2011, did you expect the economy to be where it is today? <laughs> well, uh, the economy <laughs> since I actually arrived, uh, and it's not down to me, but uh, since I arrived, the economy has done very well. It's been the strongest growing economy in uh, the G7, so of the major uh, nations. Uh, it has the highest level of employment ever. More people are at work than there ever have been in the past. Um, and wages have finally begun to grow. So lots of positive things have happened. So if you asked me then, would I be happy with that outcome? The answer would be pretty much. Um, where I'm less happy uh, is around uh, the level of productivity in the economy uh, and the fact that wage growth itself hasn't continued to pick up. And then more broadly, where I would be less happy, and certainly people, whether they're here in Merseyside, uh, across the country, are less happy, is around broader issues about the security of work, uh, uncertainty about the future. You asked questions yeah. about Brexit, it's understandable. Um, and uh, they know they have work today, not everybody, but most people do. But what kind of jobs are they going to get tomorrow? What kind of, you know, what's the media landscape going mm. to be for you, uh, Nathan, in, uh, in years to come? And are you being equipped? with the skills that you need to. Now, 
I, if I may. <laughs> you're fortunate, you're here at John Moore, so you are being equipped for those skills, but not everybody has access to that type of training and retraining, reskilling, if you will, that is necessary for uh, the modern economy. So those are some bigger issues. Not issues for the Bank of England, mm -hmm. but issues that, uh, that that we need as a as a country to hold to address. Uh, speaking going back to, to, to Brexit, you were, um, do you think that the, the Brexit has portrayed Britain from a business point of view as a very inward-looking, self-serving country to the well, outside world? It, it depends on where we go uh, with it. Um, the strategy uh, is to strike trade deals with other countries. Uh, while maintaining as much access to uh, the common market, the European market, as possible. And uh, as the government achieves that, if it achieves that, then that reinforces the historic nature of this economy and, you know, and this <laughs> port. Um, I mean, it's uh, one of the things I'll mention this afternoon when I speak is that uh, the Customs House here uh, in the middle of uh, the last century, the 19th uh, century, was the single largest source of revenue for the entire country. Uh, to th that's just an indicator of how much commerce went through this port. Mm -hmm. So the tradition of the UK has been to be an open economy. This is an opportunity to reorient that openness, if you will, a bit less from Europe, a bit more uh, to the rest of the world. And as progress is made on that, uh, it will reinforce the reputation. Do you think that there's something which is holding back the UK economy from, from growing at the moment, which a, a clear issue which is holding back prog pro uh, productivity? Well, one of the things that was holding back productivity was the financial sector. I mean, as you know, we had the big crisis and the banks were particularly were in very bad shape. So one of the things I've been working on with colleagues has been to get those banks back on their back on their feet so that they can serve the real economy, the real businesses, if you will. Um, and that is now the case. So that restriction on the economy, on productivity, is now gone. Um, we have a bit of a restriction because of uncertainty, because we're waiting to see where these relationships are going to go. But that will go pretty soon. Um, the big drivers of productivity now, and it goes back to that speech you referenced at the start of our interview, uh, are about how do we get best practice in an industry, and there's, we've got best practice in virtually every industry, examples of best practice in every industry here in the UK, and how do we spread that knowledge across firms so that those who are uh, less well performing can come up to that higher standard. Um, a lot of that's around training, uh, some of it's around uh, R&D. Uh, it shouldn't be about access to capital, which is what we've worried about and we think uh, is, is, uh, has been solved. Why did you worry about access to capital? Well, it, because we had a fundamental issue uh, in that the uh, financial institutions didn't have enough of their own capital and therefore were reluctant to lend. So we've addressed that. Uh, that's a core job of the Bank of England is to make sure the, the system has what's known as financial stability. Mm -hmm. So today, we meet today, uh, there are headlines uh, out of Europe. Uh, political events in Europe and some concerns around the implications of the political events. We want to be in a position, and we are in a position, where people here in Merseyside, across the country, think that that's interesting, mm -hmm. but not relevant. Uh, not relevant in terms of their day-to-day -day ability to go take a loan if you know they, they, they see the house uh, that's right for their family, or uh, to, uh, to invest to start up their business. Sure. Well, thank you for that. We're now going to an, uh, ask some questions of these lovely student journalists in the audience. I'm going to start with one from Christella. Hi. Um, I understand that um, your cousins live locally and that's <coughs> led you to become an Everton fan. Yes. Do you get to see them play often and what do you think of their latest performances? <laughs> Very good question. Yes, it's true. I've been, a, I've been an Evertonian since uh, the late 1980s when I first lived in the United Kingdom. I uh, came up here and saw them. I saw, I saw them in the um, 89 uh, uh, FA Cup against Liverpool. To, so uh, Ian Rush is forever burned on my, uh, <laughs> my brain and two brilliant uh, extra time goals uh, for Liverpool to win it. Um, I last saw them, I saw them in the semi-final of uh, the FA Cup last year. Um, and recent performances, um, they've been good. I think I join uh, the manager in wishing they were slightly better. Uh, I'm glad they snatched the point um, uh, yesterday, but uh, I, I think we can do, I think, I think we will do better, uh, let's put it that way, uh, in terms of uh, not dropping uh, points unnecessarily. Uh, Paige Freshwater. 
As the Governor of the Bank of England, I'm sure you've faced and overcome many problems, but did the recent controversy of the animal fats in the new £5 notes take you by surprise? Well, it did, uh, it's a good question. It did take us by surprise. It's not, uh, we were unaware of it. Um, and um, one of the core things with the central bank is to be open, accountable, transparent. So a member of the public had asked us about this. It actually took us about a month to track down the answer because we went to our main supplier and said, are there any animal fats? And they said, no, uh, we don't think. And then they said, wait a minute, we don't think so. And then they went to their suppliers and their supplier suppliers and discovered that there were these traces. Now, to, to go back to football, um, the amount that's in the note, from what we can tell, is the equivalent of if you filled Wembley Stadium three times over and then ha asked one person to leave, it's, it's that uh, amount. But the fact is there are these animal fats. It is a cause of concern for some people. We treat that with, uh, we respect those concerns. We treat it with seriousness. And so now we're working with our suppliers to find out what, what the options are. So the short answer is yes, a surprise. Um, but we weren't going to withhold that information. We let everyone know as soon as we knew and now we're trying to take action to see what we can do about it. We've got time for one more question. Kieran Simpson. Hi. Uh, the government's own investigations concluded that the national debt will be at two trillion by 2020. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think um, you, as you know, like the Bank of England, can do to try and rectify this situation? And what does it mean for future generations, like suffering because of our current borrowing? Yeah. Well, it's uh, the government's been in a difficult position since the financial crisis. So. Uh, to put some numbers around it, immediately after uh, Northern Rock, let's say, so 2009, um, uh, the deficit was almost 12% of GDP, so big, big number. And they've been working to get that down. It's down around 3.5% of GDP now. But it still means that they're building debt. And as you referenced, they'll, they'll, they expect to get to that £2 trillion pound figure uh, by 2020. Um, the issue is, what are they using the debt for? Um, and is it helping to build the productive capacity of the economy? Um, uh, for future generations. And uh, I don't speak for the government, but I'll just uh, uh, sort of quote that the discrete decisions, the individual decisions they made in the last autumn statement, the last budget, really have to do with productivity. So it's about building infrastructure and it's about investing in R&D. So they're making decisions to help close that gap that uh, Nathan was, uh, uh, to which he was referring earlier. Um, and that should give some comfort uh, to future generations. From the Bank of England's perspective, uh, what you asked, we just take that government policy as given. It's their decision. They're elected. We then have to set monetary policy to try to support the economy uh, accordingly. And it's been a big headwind against the economy. That's why we've had rates as low as uh, they have been. Well, I think that's all we've got time for. Can we all just thank Governor Mark Carney of the Bank of England? Thank you very much.